my name is Ryan Edens, and I'm a social work intern here at the network. Uh, on behalf of our organization, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all to today's webinar on reasonable accommodations and supportive housing. This webinar aims to provide an overview of supportive housing providers' obligations under anti-discrimination laws, with a particular emphasis on requirements regarding reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. We are lucky to have three amazing speakers join us today. Uh, Sandra Grestel is a senior staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice. Evan Hanley is a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society, and Edward Josephson is a supervising attorney at the Legal Aid Society. Uh, throughout the presentation, we invite you to ask questions in the Q&A, which our presenters will address either during the presentation or at the end. Um, you can find the Q&A in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, they will also be available to answer qu additional questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm pleased to hand it over to our speakers. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, as Ryan said, we're going to give a presentation today on reasonable accommodations and supportive housing. Um, I won't introduce myself with other panelists again, um, but we are all very excited to be here with you today. So first of all, first of all, I want to talk about where the obligation to provide a reasonable accommodation comes from. So there are various fair housing laws that apply in New York and New York City, um, and all of them do contain this obligation, among other obligations that I'll give a brief overview of. So first of all, fair housing or anti-discrimination laws apply to nearly all the actors in the housing market. So that includes landlords or housing providers, brokers or real estate agents, lenders such as mortgage companies, and many other types of actors who have a role in the provision of housing. Um, so at the federal level, the main law is called the Fair Housing Act or FHA. And at a state level, there's also the New York State Human Rights Law. And these laws apply to nearly all multi-unit residential properties in the state. And similarly, the New York City Human Rights Law applies to nearly all residential uh, real estate properties in the city. And an additional um, source of obligations, um, there are two of them that are the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And so for programs that receive certain types of federal funding, those may um, impose additional requirements. Um, you know, what those requirements are and who they apply to is kind of beyond the scope of this presentation, but for the purposes of reasonable accommodations, um, the obligations are more or less the same as the Fair Housing Act. So the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, which includes gender identity and, <clears throat> sorry, that should say sexual orientation, that's a typo, um, familial status and disability. And these are known as protected characteristics or protected classes. The New York State and New York City human rights laws have more protected classes than the Fair Housing Act. So uh, those laws prohibit discrimination based on all of the classes that are listed in the Fair Housing Act and others such as lawful source of income, which includes housing vouchers or subsidies, military status, age, and marital status. And so what discrimination means, um, there are a lot of different things that could amount to discrimination, but most importantly, for our purposes, that's refusing to rent to someone because of their membership um, or affiliation with protected class or requiring different rental terms of an applicant or tenant based on the protected characteristic. And what we're talking about today, reasonable accommodations, um, disability discrimination under all of those laws includes the failure to make a reasonable accommodation with a person with a disability. And as Sandra will talk more about, the New York State and especially the New York City human rights laws require more from a housing provider. They require um, more types of accommodations um, than the FHA does. So with respect to programs in the state or the city, um, people also need to be very familiar with the requirements imposed by those laws and not just federal law. 
So now I'll pass it over to Sandra to talk more in depth about reasonable accommodations. Thanks, Evan, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to take a step back to ensure that we have some shared vocabulary today. So what you'll see on the screen is a definition of what is a reasonable accommodation. It's a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that may be necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. And so the key factor here in determining whether a request is a reasonable accommodation is that nexus or connection between the disability and the requested accommodation. I wanna point out that by definition, a reasonable accommodation is an exception to policy. So, um, it, a housing provider can't deny an accommodation request merely because it violates organizational policy. And the other thing I want to emphasize here is that providers of housing have an obligation to um, accommodate tenants or provide reasonable accommodations, but supportive housing providers can also often be beneficiaries of these fair housing laws or an accommodation. And what I mean by that is uh, where a supportive housing provider may be the tenant of record in a private uh, building, uh, the supportive housing provider can ask the building owner or landlord to make accommodations to the unit. And the provider would be covered by these uh, fair housing laws. Um, similarly, if a tenant needs an accommodation that is restricted or prohibited by the funding agency contract like OMH or DOHMH, the provider can go to their contracting agency and request an exception to that contractual provision as a reasonable accommodation for that tenant where it is appropriate and warranted. Next slide. So again, with definitions, because these are really important. What is a disability? So the specific definition of disability varies slightly depending on what law you're looking at. The Fair Housing Amendments Act, the New York State, and the New York City law, they're all written a little differently. But what I have up here on the screen is the city definition of disability because generally speaking, that's the most expansive. And so if you are using that definition as a measure, you're likely going to be in good shape. Next slide. And so when we're talking about reasonable accommodations, uh, the question of a reasonable accommodation is initiated by a request. The duty to accommodate is triggered when the provider knows or should know that the client needs an accommodation. And that is true whether or not the client makes a formal request. And I'll give a, a couple examples of that in a moment. The request may be in writing or a request could be verbal and that's equally valid. There are no magic words and the client does not need to identify their concern or request as a reasonable accommodation. And many clients won't. I would also add that Many clients may not in their initial request identify the nexus or connection between their request and their disability or impairment. And so it's incumbent on the provider to inquire further when a tenant makes a request to assess whether there might be a reasonable accommodation component. Next slide. So supporting documentation, um, where the need for a reasonable accommodation is not readily apparent, the provider may request supporting documentation to establish that nexus or connection between the disability and the requested accommodation. And what do I mean by 
uh, the need not being readily apparent. So if you see a tenant or a client who is using crutches, uh, for example, um, their uh, mobility impairments will be readily apparent. Um, however, when we're uh, within the realm of mental health related disabilities um, and a variety of other disabilities, those can often be invisible disabilities. And so there may be occasions where the need for reasonable accommodation is not readily apparent and the housing provider does have um, the right to request documentation to, to show that nexus. Now, what form that documentation comes in is open uh, according to the New York City Human Rights Law. Um, providers can't require a specific type or form of documentation and providers cannot require individuals to provide medical records or to provide um, access, direct access to their doctors or um, medical providers. Uh, the documentation, the standard for what documentation is uh, sufficient to support a reasonable accommodation is that it must be minimally sufficient to establish the existence of the disability or impairment and the relationship between the disability and the requested accommodation. And then the last paragraph or point on this screen talks about what happens where a provider um, believes that the provided doc documentation is insufficient. So you can't just deny a request because you don't have enough documentation to see um, that the request is warranted. Instead, the provider should be requesting additional documentation to establish that nexus. If the client can sense the provider could request and speak to the healthcare provider directly um, to get that additional information to establish the nexus, but a client or tenant is not required to provide ac direct access or direct communication with their provider. And they should be afforded the opportunity to provide additional written documentation if they're not comfortable um, consenting to that direct uh, communication or, or contact with their medical provider. So um, after the request is made or after the provider has reason to know that a client may need an accommodation, uh, that begins the cooperative dialogue, um, or sometimes it's referred to as an interactive dialogue process. And the city defines the term cooperative dialogue as the process by which a covered entity, which is the housing provider, and the person entitled to an accommodation, who would be the client in, in these situations, engage in a good faith written or oral dialogue concerning the person's accommodation needs. So that dialogue can include um, their requested accommodation, can cover uh, alternative potential accommodations that may still address the person's accommodation needs, and may include discussion of the difficulties that the potential accommodation may pose for the covered entity or the housing provider. Um, so as the definition implies, providers do not have to offer the exact accommodation or exact mechanism that the person requests. Um, however, if the provider offers an alternative, it still has to meet the needs of the, of the person who made the request. And, if the um, provider is unable to meet the request, it must show that um, the requested accommodation would be an undue burden. And I'm just noticing that there's a typo on the slide. It says if the court claims not to be able to meet the request, but it should be housing provider there. Um, each situation is unique. There is no one size fits all. Um, and that's really important to keep in mind. 
And lastly, um, you know, the dialogue is a process uh, which can take varying lengths of time, but when it concludes, the provider must notify the client in writing so that there is um, a shared understanding that the dialogue has come to a close. Next screen. So as I just mentioned, a cooperative dialogue is ongoing until one of the following occurs. Um, on the screen, you'll see the potential resolutions of that cooperative dialogue process. So at the end of the dialogue, either the provider grants the reasonable accommodation request, or the parties identify an alternative accommodation which equally meets the needs of the individual, or after the cooperative dialogue, the provider concludes that there's no accommodation that can be made without an undue hardship to the housing provider. Next slide. So now we're moving on to look at some specific common reasonable accommodation requests in supportive housing. So, First up are emotional support animals, and I'm sure you all see these requests all the time. Housing providers are required to reasonably accommodate persons with disabilities who rely on service animals or emotional support animals by providing exceptions to no pet or no dog policies. And so a couple of things I wanna point out here. Um, again, if a supportive housing provider is renting a unit in a private building where there is a separate building owner or landlord, and it is that separate building owner or landlord who has the no pet policy, the building owner or landlord is also obligated to accommodate the occupant in the apartment. So you as providers should know that um, you have this obligation, but also the building owners have this obligation. And so if you go to a building owner and they tell you, this is a no pet building, we told you that from the beginning, um, you know that you have um, some protections and some recourse on behalf of your client. Um, and then you'll also see on the screen, sometimes folks can be confused about what is a service animal and what is an emotional support animal because people use different terms um, at different times. And there are different definitions, but the New York City Human Rights Law covers both. And so the client comes to you and they request a service animal or an emotional support animal, both requests are covered by the New York City Human Rights Law. Um, the, let's see, can we go back? Thank you. So the other thing I just wanna highlight is that um, some buildings have breed, weight, or size restrictions on pets. And those two, um, the landlord needs to make exceptions to those breed size or weight restrictions um, where those exceptions are required to accommodate someone. And this can come up occasionally in the context of animals like pit bulls um, or other breeds where there's stigma around um, the breed characteristics, um, often unfounded stigma. Um, but where those restrictions exist, uh, exceptions also need to be made. And an analogy that I often use when people refer to no pet policies is that a service animal or an emotional support animal is not considered a pet under the law. It's more like an assistive technology or device. Um, so it's the equivalent of you know, a wheelchair, um, or other assisted technology. And so the no pet restrictions shouldn't apply. And I just wanna acknowledge that for providers of supportive housing, the ESA issues can be quite challenging because certainly where you have tenants um, residing in shared living situations, you know, you're dealing with potential allergies, uh, it can be difficult to navigate, um, but, the law does entitle um, 
tenants to emotional support animals um, where they require them. Uh, and so housing providers have an obligation to accommodate. Next slide. So on the screen, I have an example, a real life example of a pet policy and a supportive housing program. And I'm just gonna have it on the screen for a minute for folks to take a look at. Um, and we won't have discussion about it today uh, because this is a webinar presentation, um, but I just want you to take a moment to read it and think about what do you notice and what are the issues with this policy as it's written? So again, I'll just give a minute for, for you to take a look. And then just briefly before we move on, I'll point out that um, this policy requires a tenant be psychiatrically evaluated by a landlord employed psychiatrist regarding the need for the pet. Um, and just referencing back to when we talked about supporting documentation, a provider cannot require a specific um, kind of documentation. So looking at this policy, I would say it's problematic because it's requiring a specific kind of documentation. Um, so something to keep in mind as you're going back to your agencies and reviewing um, your organizational pet or ESA policies. Hi, Sandra, before we move on, I think there's one question that would be useful to answer live. Um, yeah. The question is, are there restrictions on the type of animal, i.e. fish, as an emotional support animal? Great question. So no, there are no restrictions. Um, uh, the only restrictions that exist are the restrictions that exist in New York City or state law. So if someone has a tiger um, in their apartment, that would be an issue. Um, but assuming it's legal to possess the animal in question, there aren't restrictions on the what can constitute an emotional support animal. What's really important is that that person has the supporting documentation to show that there is that nexus. So if someone's uh, medical provider documents and attests that this fish is this person's um, emotional support animal, then that would qualify. And uh, this is a great question I also see about um, what can we do when we make reasonable accommodations for an emotional support animal and the animal is aggressive, poorly trained and frightened staff and residents? So in those situations, and I know they come up and can be quite challenging, um, there are various accommodations that can be made to um, preserve the, the person animal uh, relationship that could include um, having a conversation about whether muzzling in uh, public or common areas is appropriate, uh, whether the animal can get additional training um, to address any behavioral concerns. Um, basically where, what the city legal guidance says is that where a particular animal creates legitimate health or safety concerns, the housing provider and resident must engage in another cooperative dialogue to determine what other accommodation might be possible. Uh, thank you. And I'll just note, we got a number of questions about ESAs. I'm gonna save the rest of those for the end during the Q&A session. Thank you, Sandra. Perfect, thank you, Evan. So the next category of commonly requested reasonable accommodations are physical modifications to the space and or use of technology. I paired these. So the city law requires that um, where a reasonable accommodation may involve making the housing more accessible 
uh, either through alterations to the existing physical space or structures or through the installation and use of technology. That's at the housing provider's expense. Um, and a couple common examples are replacing a bathtub um, or a shower stall with a roll-in shower. Um, I see that a lot. Um, also potentially noise mitigation through additional carpeting and or insulation could be a physical modification that a tenant requires as a reasonable accommodation. Um, and another common one is a relocation to an elevator building or a ground floor unit, um, particularly where someone may have mobility limitations. And so I have a couple examples um, that I frequently see in my work on the screen. Um, one, the first one is related to elevators. And if you know that a client has mobility limitations and there's an elevator outage and or the elevator requires repair that's going to um, take an, uh, an extended period of time, uh, the housing provider should consider whether temporarily relocating the resident to an alternative unit is possible. Um, and the second example, this is another situation I frequently see, which is where someone's residing in shared living in a roommate situation, um, but because of their particular symptoms and impairments, they are unable to reside with roommates. And I want to be clear that I'm not talking about uh, tenant preference here, um, because, you know, most of us don't want to live with roommates if we don't need to, but I'm talking about um, doc a documented medical need for someone to live in a single occupancy unit and where someone informs their provider with supporting documentation that there is that medical need, the provider has an obligation to accommodate unless that relocation poses an undue hardship. And this is a situation where um, sometimes requesting the exception from the contracting government agency may be helpful or necessary if your contract with the city or state places some limitations or barriers to transferring that tenant to a single occupancy unit. You know, I encourage you to talk to that, um, your contracting agency to make an exception as a reasonable accommodation where it's appropriate and warranted. Next screen. So then I spoke spotlighted, you know, a few of the main accommodations that uh, I see in my work. Um, the other umbrella category are exceptions to standard policies and practices. And, you know, I have a few common uh, examples on the screen. One example I've seen recently is a tenant who, due to both mental health and physical limitations, um, cannot uh, pay their rent in person or with a paper check. And they were requesting to pay through an electronic, um, like direct bank transfer. And their housing provider said, I'm sorry, like you can't do that. That's not our um, organizational practice. And so this is a good example where it may not be standard operating procedure and that's okay. Um, but where there is that documented need for the exception, and the provider should be looking for ways to make that exception. Um, a few other examples, permitting a live-in personal care attendant, um, exceptions to package delivery, um, providing additional time for residents to come into compliance with program rules. That's a big one. Um, assisting with obtaining public benefits, including one-shot deals, uh, et cetera. These really speak for themselves. Um, and I guess the last category uh, or example I'd flag under excep exceptions to policies and practices are these eviction prevention interventions, um, which can qualify as a kind of reasonable accommodation. And I'm going to turn it over to Ed to speak more on that. Hi, everyone. Um, 
so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, eviction prevention as a form of reasonable accommodation. And the inspiration for, for really this, this session was um, one of uh, Shinny's members that decided um, to adopt a written policy on reasonable accommodations in the, in the eviction prevention um, framework, which I think was circulated with the materials for, for, um, for this uh, webinar, or if it isn't, I think it will be circulated. Um, and which, and so the question is, you know, what's, what is the purpose of adopting some kind of a written policy? And you may be sitting there thinking, as you've listened to this, you know, well, we already, we, we already do all of this because after all, the whole purpose of affordable, of supportive housing is precisely to accommodate people with disabilities um, so that they can, you know, function in a, re in a, in a residential setting um, in an appropriate way. Um, so, you know, if it's already something that everybody does, you know, why would you, why would you even need a policy? And what we found, you know, both um, in our interactions with this particular provider um, and, you know, over the course of our work generally is that um, even though the overall framework of supportive housing um, is to accommodate people that the implementation of it in particular contexts, you know, can be challenging. And, you know, I, I was just looking at the questions in the chat and, and you can see when you look at those that um, the answers to exactly how people should be accommodated in any particular context, you know, it's difficult. There are, you know, there are uh, kind of shades of meaning um, that have to be negotiated. Um, and the very concept of reasonableness is one that is not, you know, kind of a mathematically precise context uh, concept, and it's different. Um, it's really case by case. And, and so that's very challenging to, to administer something like that. And so, you know, our feeling was that it can only help to have a clear written framework that staff, people, and supervisors can refer to. Um, and especially so when you are regularly onboarding new staff, and I would assume that uh, the people on this webinar are subject to the same kinds of staff retention and turnover that all of us have been struggling with, you know, since at least since COVID. And so you always have new people coming on board and it's very helpful um, for people to have a reference. Um, and, particularly in the context of eviction proceedings, um, it can sometimes happen that a resident is not complying with program policies to a greater or lesser extent, and it can be tempting to wanna to resolve those through the context of an eviction proceeding, but there are also downsides to that, you know, which I think you're all familiar with. You know, number one is that your mission is to house people, not to not to unhouse them, um, and so eviction should really be, you know, the last resort after other alternatives are explored, and it can help to have a policy, a written policy that says exactly that. Um, and also, you know, eviction you know, obviously not has a downside for the resident, but also for the program because it means that you're expending time and you know precious money. Um, to pay lawyers to um, bring such a proceeding. The tenant, you know, then is often uh, has a guardian ad litem appointed. The proceeding can be lengthy. They may have a, a lawyer appointed and then it gets even more lengthy. And sometimes all of this can be unnecessary um, if an accommodation is explored before uh, you know, the program goes down the road of eviction. Um, so next slide, I think. Um, and so in this sample policy, you know, the first thing is that it's, there's a statement of um, the general idea that eviction should be a last resort after other um, alternatives are explored. And it also makes clear that staff and residents should um, inquire into the need for a reasonable accommodation, even if the resident doesn't understand that 
there is such, you know, that there's such a thing as the Fair Housing Act, or that there's such a thing as a reasonable accommodation. It may be apparent that someone could could use such an accommodation. And you know, if the the tricky thing here is that the more impaired the person is, the less likely they are to understand that they could or should make a request for the accommodation that they need. And that's why. In that context, the law puts the burden on the provider to at least think about whether an accommodation might be appropriate or possible. Um, and you know, you know, one accommodation that comes to mind is you know a common scenario is people who um, have difficulty maintaining their unit in a you know sanitary and uncluttered state, and they you know, may well benefit from some kind of cleaning of their apartment. They may not know to ask for it. Um, there may need to be a dialogue around persuading the person um, to permit it. Um, but better to try that you know, accommodation first before starting an eviction proceeding where the same issues will come up, the same accommodation may need to be made further down the line after a lot of time and expense has been you know, incurred. Um, the policy also talks about the interactive process and dialogue. And again, um, you know, as, as Sandra says, there's not a one size fits all um, framework um, and it's case by case. And it may vary from provider to provider because when you're talking about an undue burden, you know, some programs are larger than others. Some have more resources than others. You know, some have multiple buildings, some have only one. And so, you know, what may be a prohibitive expense for, you know, one kind of landlord may not be prohibited um, to, you know, a, a landlord with more resources. And so it, it's, it's very hard to say in the abstract what, you know, what is reasonable and on the flip side, what is an undue burden. And the only real mandate is that um, the provider, you um, examine what the alternatives is in a, in a kind of open-minded way and you know do their best to do an accommodation that um, benefits the tenant or, or resident and on the resident side um, the, you know the resident is also supposed to approach this with a certain amount of flexibility um, knowing that they may not get the accommodation that they most prefer, but what they are entitled to is an accommodation that allows them to you know, continue to remain housed and you know, enjoy and benefit from their housing. Um, so could I have the next slide? Um, so in this particular you know, uh, policy, and again, it's not like this, we are necessarily advocating that everybody adopt a policy in word for word, um, like the one that was circulated, um, this policy sets a kind of minimal floor for the kind of uh, accommodations that could be provided. You know, some programs might want to have a, a much longer and more detailed policy. Um, you know, that may be beneficial um, in, you know, in some contexts and maybe not in others. Um, and you know, it also may depend on the particular population that you serve. Um, or, you know, again, the, you know, the size of the program, whether you have only one kind of resident or whether you provide many different kinds of um, uh, services to different populations. Um, next slide. Um, and so I think I already um, went over Sorry. that. Yes. Um, could you go to the next one, I think? Um, and so in this particular you know, sample policy, one of the distinctions that drawn is, you know, does the tenant pose some kind of immediate danger to other residents or to staff? Um, you know, someone who's engaging in maybe uh, aggressive or, or life-threatening uh, behavior, it may be appropriate to commence a, an eviction proceeding right away while continuing to explore alternatives. Um, in other contexts, you know, it would be more appropriate to first, you know, go through the whole dialogue process before resorting to the kind of extreme remedy of um, commencing, you know, a proceeding in court. Um, the service plan that would be explored, you know, maybe something that you as a provider would um, 
would provide yourselves, but it may also um, involve outside referrals or you know, city agencies, you know, such as adult protective services, um, or you know, I don't know, you know, there may be cleaning services. There may be all kinds of different um, uh, what's the word um, entities out, uh, in the world that could provide services to um, your residents, um, and it may sometimes be a, a appropriate to, to call on them as, as, as a reasonable accommodation. Um, financial management, you know, we find often that um, some residents may have difficulty, you know, complying with their payment obligations for all kinds of different reasons. And sometimes we'll see, you know, a non-payment case in housing court when um, what they really, you know, the tenant really needs is some kind of financial management. Some programs are able to do financial management themselves. Some may need to call on adult protective services to do that. Sometimes the solution can be as simple as helping the tenant set up an automatic bill payment out of, out of a bank account, and they don't actually need someone, you know, literally managing their money. Um, many residents uh, need help accessing rent arrears um, from Department of Social Services. Others you know, are able to do it on their own. Um, and so that is something that could uh, profitably be explored before going down the, the route of starting a non-payment proceeding only to find that these exact accommodations need to be um, provided down the line after you've gone to expense and delay. Um, next. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing we find is maybe very beneficial both to, to the resident and to the program and to the court if an eviction proceeding is um, commenced is that many providers um, who are regulated by OMH or other entities um, have legally mandated content that would have to go into a pre-eviction termination notice. And many times uh, it's required that the tenant have a right to present uh, objections to the termination notice, um, which is really just another form of the cooperative dialogue that's imposed by the human rights laws. Um, and so you'd wanna check with you know, your own you know, legal provider about what those requirements are. Um, but even if there's a legally mandated form of the termination notice, everything is subject to reasonable accommodation. So for example, a, if you have a resident that you know is, uh, has literacy barriers, then just giving them a notice, you know, full of legal boilerplate, you know, is not really serving the function of the notice. And, you know, that tenant may need someone to read the notice to them or explain it to them in a way that, um, uh, that they can understand and, and, and respond to. And the same, of course, goes to um, uh, people with, you know, different kinds of visual hearing impairments we actually had to litigate against a government entity that was refusing to do anything other than send a written notice to someone who was actually blind. And I, I, I still can't believe we had to litigate that case um, to get that person an accommodation when it was so obvious. Um, the other thing that we find is that eviction proceedings may create preventable harm to uh, people with disabilities where residents who can't really understand or appropriately um, respond to an eviction notice, um, you know, we've seen, we've had clients come in who then have a default judgment entered against them because the court doesn't know that a disabled person is involved in the case and may you know, need an accommodation or may need a guardian. And so in this policy that was adopted, it says, I think in a very beneficial way that um, when it gets to the stage of actually uh, filing an eviction proceeding in court, that the court papers themselves should alert the court that this is a supportive housing program, that the respondent in the proceeding is a disabled person who may need a guardian or some other um, 
accommodation and that the court should be on notice of that before there's any kind of request for a default judgment so that guardian litem could be appointed, could reach out to the respondent, um, and rather than have the judgment entered only to have you know, a lawyer come in later and try to you know, vacate the whole thing, go back to square one, or even worse, you know, that a tenant get evicted on default where um, you know, an accommodation could have been provided and the whole eviction prevented. Uh, so next, next slide. Um, the other thing that, as you know, often comes up is that sometimes a, a resident may need a higher level of care, um, at, which would imply that a reasonable accommodation would be to uh, assist the tenant in transferring to an appropriate you know, care facility. Um, in our view, it would be you know, a rare thing that an appropriate uh, that the, no one would ever benefit from actually being evicted and made homeless when there's any other you know, possible alternative. And so even if an eviction proceeding is um, commenced, you know, the sample policy uh, requires that the program staff explore and assist simultaneously with some kind of a transfer if there is a level of care you know, that can accommodate the, the, the resident. Um, and also in the sample policy is the idea that the duty to accommodate never stops. It's never too late to provide an accommodation. So even if the eviction proceeding has gone on for a considerable period of time, if in the end of the day, for example, you know, it's possible to clean up a cluttered apartment and resolve the problem, um, you know, that legal requirement remains in effect, um, you know, throughout, throughout a, even an eviction proceeding. Um, and then once, once the problem is resolved, um, you know, it may seem obvious, but then the eviction proceeding should also be resolved. You know, if there's no need for an eviction, then there shouldn't be an eviction. Um, next uh, slide. Oh, that's it. Okay, so now I think there's been a lot of questions in the chat, and I won't I won't answer them all. But um, you yeah, know, time for questions. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so I think Sandra did a lot of work already, in the yeah. chat, but we'll begin by posing the questions that remain, and then we'll open the floor to people who have further questions. You either can put your question in the Q and A section, or you can um, raise your hand using Zoom and we should be able to see that and be able to unmute you so you can ask your question out loud. But we'll start by going through the Q&A. Okay, so I'm just gonna do this in, in the order that they're displayed on my end. So the first question is, what happens in a case where the housing provider cannot make the exception to a request, i.e. there is no option for an electronic payment? Anyone wanna answer that one? I can start. Go ahead, go ahead Sandra. Um, and then Ed, if you want to jump in, I mean, I think this speaks to the role of the cooperative dialogue in the reasonable accommodation process. Um, you know, at my initial reaction is it's hard for me to imagine a situation where there would be no means to make an electronic payment because we live in an electronic world now. But that said, I don't run uh, an organization and so I don't know the specific limitations you might be facing. But where the electronic payment is absolutely not possible, um, then you explore other accommodations. Maybe uh, a staff person retrieves payment um, at the apartment directly to um, prevent the need for the tenant to go to a main office to make payment. It really depends on the specific circumstances and the basis for the accommodation that the tenant is requesting. Um, so both what is the barrier that the tenant is facing in making rent payment the way the provider seeks and what is the barrier um, on the part of the provider from 
to adjusting their policy to uh, accept electronic payment? And is it really impossible or an undue burden on the provider to adjust uh, their practice? And Ed, you were gonna add? Yeah, I was just gonna add, you know, it's also, you know, there can be a certain amount of trial and error, you know, so it might be you'd explore, um, could the caseworker knock on the person's door and rem remind them that it's rent payment time? But, you know, maybe that person needs help going and buying a money order because they're mobility impaired, or that might fail. And then you might say, well, actually, this person, we might need to refer to adult protective services, you know, for actual, you know, financial management, because, you know, we've tried other things and that hasn't worked out. Um, some of you who have experience with adult protective services may feel that that's a last resort that you want to get involved in, but you know, sometimes that may be necessary. Um, and, um, and, and, and so with you know, every kind of accommodation, you may try the most kind of minimally intrusive thing. And then if that doesn't work, you know, go on to a next step. Um, but there, it's, I think, a rare case where there's no accommodation at all that, that would solve the problem. OK, thank you. Um, so next. And I'll start by answering this question after I read it, and then please jump in, uh, Sandra and Ed, if you have further thoughts. So what steps are taken as a supportive housing provider if a client declines several accommodations offered? So this goes back to the cooperative dialogue or interactive process that we've been talking about. Um, you know, as Sandra mentioned, it's not necessarily the case that a housing provider has to give the exact accommodation that the client requests. Um, they need to do one that's appropriate and reasonable. And so, you know, in that situation, I would start by asking why the client is declining that accommodation. And because the, the reason might be is because the accommodation that's offered is not appropriate. It's not actually going to resolve the issue that they're having. And so, you know, I would engage with the client and talk to them and try to come to a solution that is acceptable to the housing provider and also acceptable to the client. Um, and go down that road for quite a while before there is the final determination that Sandra talked about where you need to put the answer in writing and then the client will take that answer and, and you know, either accept it or they will challenge it, right? But it's not just that the housing provider can say no and give three options to the client and that's the end of their responsibility. They need to engage in the, the cooperative dialogue as we discussed. Anything you want to add to that, Sandra? Ed? Okay. I would just I would just say, you know, there, there's also, you know, there may be ways to persuade someone, you know, if if, if the combination really, you know, it might be in their best interest, you know, they might have a social their own social worker, they might have relatives who are in the picture who might you know, help facilitate, you know, uh, an agreement on an accommodation. Um, so again, you know, it's not an all size fits, you know, one size fits all, you know, every, uh, and, and a certain amount of creativity, you know, it's, it really helps. Yeah, I think Ed was reading my mind. I was thinking, um, you know, practically speaking, we know that sometimes when there is a cooperative dialogue that is required, there may have already been some breakdown in communication and or the working relationship between the provider and the consumer. That happens for a variety of reasons. And so if there is a way to call on um, collateral contacts or another individual that um, where there is baseline trust with the consumer, that person may be able to assist in facilitating the dialogue process to explore potential accommodations. Great. Um, so the next question is about ending the tenancy of someone who's out of the apartment for a protracted period without going to housing court. So as I think you might understand, we're not able to give advice to anyone about how to end a tenancy. Um, because we defend tenants. So I would just suggest that you talk to your own attorney if you have questions about what procedures are necessary um, in that type of situation. So next question, who makes the determination that a tenant requires a higher level of care? What kind of documentation is required to support that determination and which party is 
responsible for gathering that information. Well, you know, it, it's all the same answer. It's the, um, in, in the sense, it gets re repetitive. You know that it's 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 part of it's part of the cooperative process. You know, I think it it may well be the the provider who feels that the resident needs a higher level of care. Um, it could be the resident themselves saying, "I'm not getting getting the support that I need here," um, and then and then there is a discussion and dialogue, and and different documentation would be required in different um, circumstances. And you know, the provider may well have ample documentation in their own files, or it may be that they need to reach out to, you know, if the tenant has an independent provider, um, that may be relevant. Um, so it's, it's reasonable to assist the guideline. The next question, is a tenant declining offered units in undue hardship? We've had cases where we offer multiple options for reasonable accommodations, where, which a tenant declines due to not liking the neighborhood, the unit's too small, et cetera. Um, but we always struggle with the point where we can basically say, we tried, you declined, we're closing out the request. So yeah, I mean, to, to that, right? Again, I would say it depends, right? It's very context dependent, um, as Ed talked about, where there is, a uh, request for accommodation, what undue hardship means really depends on the provider, right? So um, we can't really give a, a straight answer to that yes or no. Uh, in that type of situation, again, I think from our perspective, the important thing is to continue to try to engage the tenant, um, engage other supports if necessary, if there is that breakdown that Sandra and Ed talked about, um, where there might be some type of communication failure that's contributing to the failure to reach a, a resolution here. Can I just add as a couple specific examples, um, you know, this is through the cooperative dialogue, that's an opportunity for the provider to investigate what are the barriers or obstacles to the tenant accepting the unit that's offered. So for example, the tenant may communicate in some way that they don't like the neighborhood. But if you ask a few follow-up questions, pointed questions, you may learn that the new apartment is an hour commute away from their medical treatment team and their support network. So it's not that they just don't like the neighborhood, but the apartment may not be suitable for their needs if they rely on regular access to their treatment providers and support structure. That's just one example. Um, another example might be, you know, given the cost of real estate in New York, um, we all know that uh, a lot of um, supportive housing apartments are rented in buildings where there are repairs needed. Um, and the landlord may not be maintaining the building in the condition in which it should be maintained. And so again, is it that the tenant just declines the apartment because they don't like it? Or is it that they are declining the apartment because there are housing code violations and they don't wanna move into a situation where they're facing neglected repairs that may also have adverse health consequences like um, you know, asthma or respiratory issues where there's chronic, um, where there may be a chronic mold or pest issue. So again, through that cooperative dialogue, being able to investigate what is lying beneath the, um, refusal of a particular unit, because there may be something that you can work with there. Thank you, Sandra. So the next question, how do you create an eviction prevention policy when you're the supportive housing social services provider, but the, le the lease is actually between the resident and the, the landlord itself. So the supportive housing provider essentially isn't part of that contract seems to be the question. I think that's a great question. Ed or Sander, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, well, yeah, I think, you know, then it's a slightly different kind of eviction prevention policy because you're trying to prevent the owner of the building from evicting the tenant. But I think the content of it probably would be very similar in the sense that, 
you're trying to provide extra supports to your client um, to remedy whatever conflict is, is arising between the, uh, the, the landlord and, and your client. So again, you know, in a cluttered apartment, you know, helping with decluttering would you know, diffuse that situation. Um, but then in, in or uh, if the if the client is paying the rent directly to the landlord, you know, financial management might assist with something like that. Um, but then there are other contexts, like uh, Sandra was pointing out, where it may be that the landlord is refusing to accommodate the tenant in some way, say their emotional support animal, and then. Um, you as as a provider um, might need to take action to. Uh, advocate for your client's rights, you know, with respect to the owner of the building and say that they have to provide an accommodation and, you know, conceivably your legal, you know, your legal uh, backup would, might need to be involved um, to make sure that your client receives their rights under the human rights law. Yeah, and the thing I would add to that, this might be difficult, right, um, given that the provider doesn't necessarily have a ton of leverage in this situation. But if you do have a lot of participants in your programs who live in the units held by one landlord, you could advocate for that landlord to adopt policies. They also have the duty to do a reasonable accommodation, right? And so you could be proactive and suggest that they adopt the same type of policy that the supportive housing provider did. And the reasons why that owner should adopt that policy are essentially the same. Um, and so that's something that your program could do. So this is a, a service or support animal question. Can the housing provider request that the service or support animals be muzzled in common areas or make a request for additional training if necessary? Yeah, so great question. Um, frequently asked question that I think I semi-addressed already in the Q&A, but basically um, where an animal has, the animal or the behavior of a particular animal has caused harm in some way, then yes, that could trigger a follow-up cooperative dialogue to figure out how to either maintain the animal in the premises or identify an alternative accommodation. And so as part of that cooperative dialogue, yes, a provider can absolutely explore whether uh, muzzling in common areas and or additional training um, is viable. But again, I wanna emphasize that that request um, needs, to needs to be based on the specific behavior of that specific animal, like an incident has occurred and not based on speculation or fear around the type of harm that could occur. So that's important to keep in mind. So the next question is essentially about um, what to do if a resident consistently doesn't pay rent and won't participate in money management or send electronic payments. So the situation is that they constantly are having recourse to one-shot deals to, to pay their rents. Um, what should someone do in that situation? Again, I'd say um, having more conversations about what the barriers are to paying rent. Um, I mean, what we also know about most tenants and supportive housing is that uh, even though the rent may be set at 30% of their documented, documented income, um, folks have fixed limited income. And so it is hard to get by in New York City on public assistance or SSI. So following up to explore what are the barriers, um, I would also add that this kind of question um, seems like ripe for discussion within the Shinny community. Like Shinny as a, a collective of similarly uh, positioned providers, you know, one of the benefits is that you all can be uh, crowdsourcing different strategies to deal with these really difficult situations. Um, and so calling on each other as a resource 
um, can be really helpful here. Yeah, it just, um, if I could just add, it's not strictly a reasonable accommodation thing, but we actually, um, and some people from Shinny, I forget which programs, um, tried to open a dialogue with, with, uh, with the city over uh, actually accommodating your programs because it seems so ridiculous that you all have to spend money bringing non-payment proceedings against your residents instead of there being some kind of ombuds person at HRA who you could just go to and say, you know, we have 10 residents in our building and they owe X amount of money. Um, would you please, you know, issue one-shot deals? Um, and I, we were not successful, but I think that is, is a, a, an idea that we could or you could, you know, raise with HRA because it just seems so ridiculous for you to spend money to go to court and then the city pays us to go in and defend the tenant and only to have them issue the same one shot deal that they could have done um, without any of that time and expense um, seems, you know, absurd. And, and ultimately, maybe they will see the, the, the sense of that. Um, but, you know, in terms of the, you know, ultimately, sometimes, you know, money management is a diff difficult thing. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with Sandra, you know, it's something that maybe as a community would be good to explore for, for you all. So next question is, you mentioned noise mitigation. Can you elaborate if I'm a noisy tenant, might we soundproof my apartment? So yes, um, that is one option if the person needs an accommodation because of noise. Um, you know, there could be the exploration of installing some type of soundproofing in the apartment. You know, a, a famous situation that's discussed sometimes among housing attorneys is that there are kind of micro measures that you could perhaps take. Um, there's one case where a tenant got an accommodation um, where the tenant was alleged to have banged things around the apartment that basically they were given a, a foam like Nerf bat, right? And that's what they used at that point to, to hit things in the apartment. Um, to their disability, which obviously didn't disturb anybody, right? So there are different measures and creative measures should be explored if there are complaints about noise um, that might be soundproof in the apartment, but it could be something short of that, um, such as, you know, maybe moving them to, uh, you know, a floor where they're not on top. It might be a ground floor where they're no longer on, on top of another tenant, for example, it could be a solution that you might want to explore if there are complaints about noise. Sandra, do you have anything to add to that one? Nope, okay. Um, so this next question is a good one as well. It's interesting. When federal, federal funding restricts the use of marijuana, but the state has legalized it, what can be done when a tenant requests a reasonable accommodation to use marijuana for medical reasons? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I was gonna say, it's a great question. I don't know the current state of the law on, on this particular issue, but if, if none of us has an answer at the ready, we can certainly follow up. Yeah, it's, it's possible that, um, you know, there's been guidance issued by, um, by the, the administration um, about whether, you know, how it should be treated in public housing, for example, right, which is where you'd see this issue most often just because there's so many people living in public housing across the country. Um, so we can see if there's any guidance about that. I think that's also, you know, something that you should obviously talk to your own legal counsel about if you have concerns. I mean, if it was my client in, in, in the, you know, who had that need, I, I would not be embarrassed to argue that the federal government has a duty to make exceptions to its policy when it's medically required, um, whether, you know, you as a provider would want to get involved in something like that is a, you know, a different kind of policy issue. But, but I think um, my, my instinct is that the federal policy should not be inflexibly imposed on people who really need uh, marijuana to function. Agreed. Yeah. And again, this is a case where there are two federal laws kind of intersecting possibly, right? One is the prohibition on controlled substances, including marijuana. The other is that you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities under the Fair Housing Act and other laws, right? So it's not as if 
the federal law kind of knocks out your obligations under state and local law, you also have the obligation under federal law. So it is a, a complicated question, um, but it certainly is not, there's no bright line answer to that, I think. Um, but we're not sure about is whether the federal government has given their view on that position, not that we necessarily would agree with it, but um, we can look into that. And if it does exist, we can share that along with the materials um, when I correct the, the few typos that exist in the slides before we circulate it. Okay. Um, client has been missing from the residence. Um, the staff has tried to find them um, and they were spotted by the outside outreach team approximately two weeks ago. And they haven't made, they made another attempt to engage, but not have been successful. How long do we hold the apartment? So, you know, again, how long to hold the apartment? That's a question that I think you should consult with your legal counsel and other program authorities about. But in terms of guidelines and recommendations about how to, to contact someone who's out on the street, that's a little beyond our expertise, I think, right? Um, it's not really a legal question. It's a question of how best to engage in someone with someone in that situation, right? And so, as Sandra said, you know, using crowdsourcing amongst yourselves, talking to, to other people who have the expertise in the relevant government agencies would be the, the first approach that I would take. And I would just add that even though we're not positioned to give specific legal advice on specific situations, city and state law does require that where a tenant has occupied their apartment lawfully for 30 days, at least 30 days and or subject to a lease agreement, they cannot be evicted without court process. In cases of physical modifications to units, the reasonable accommodation request need to spell out the specific modification or does this come out through the cooperative dialogue? So no, they don't need to spell out the specific modification. They certainly can, um, but they don't need to. So if there are any things that are ambiguous on your end, or if you're uncertain about anything, then you should engage in that, that dialogue and you know, come to try to come to a conclusion and a resolution with the tenant about what their modification is and whether it's reasonable or not. So what if your tenant is in legal? So I assume that means in the eviction process, can I get the accommodation against the landlord's resistance and agreement to help the client? So I assume this is a situation where the landlord itself has taken the client to housing court and trying to evict them and, and not the supportive housing provider. Um, so this goes back to a little bit of what Ed was saying earlier that in that case, the client needs an accommodation then your program should seek to be an advocate on the client's behalf with the housing provider um, and maybe engage with the tenant's lawyer that if they have one or if not, um, assist the tenant themselves in making this reasonable accommodation request and also making the court aware that they have made the, the reasonable accommodation request. That's also important. Um, so the duty to accommodate for any housing provider exists as long as the tenancy exists. So as, as long as the Ten, the tenant has not been physically evicted essentially is the way that most courts interpret it, that duty still exists. So it doesn't matter that the housing court case has started, the duty to engage in this process and explore accommodations remains the same up until the actual eviction. So I would suggest that you know your program engages with the client, with their attorney if they have one, um, and tries to act as an advocate along with the tenant for any accommodation that's needed and is reasonable. And I just add that this is a situation where it would be to everyone's advantage for the tenant to have their own attorney, you know, from MFJ or legal aid. Um, and then, you know, uh, we could work together to make sure that the tenant has the accommodations that they need. Can you speak more on the accommodation for a live-in aid? Um, so that's a, a pretty common request for an accommodation where someone um, because of a disability needs essentially around the clock support, right? That, you know, just eight hours or 12 hours during the day is not enough. And, and so that situation, the accommodation would often be 
to obtain a larger unit size because they need a place for the living aid to, to live and sleep, right? Um, so there's kind of two levels to it. Number one, they need to have a household member added, but adding that household member would often result in the need for a larger unit. And so those accommodations um, requests should be evaluated in the same way as any others, but you know, they're ones that are needed. And I think you know, more and more people, the aging population in this country are requesting those, um, those accommodations. What do you do if a tenant won't stop smoking in the rooms and is refusing, refusing all available resources to stop? <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyone want to take that one? Well, you know, again, it's 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 sort of the same answer, you know, over and over again. That I mean, you could come to a point where the tenant is, you know, posing a, a health hazard to the people around them, and there's no, you know, and is refusing everything that's reasonable. But there might be, you know, the the duty is to explore, you know, whatever might be possible, you know. So it might depend on the kind of building that they're in. It might, you know, is there some way to, you know seal off the you know the apartment so the smoke doesn't escape it might be that that's not possible it might be that someone uh out you know outside your your program could persuade the tenant to um you know quit smoking or smoke outside um you know there i i guess in in our experience you know sometimes there are people who are you know at the end of the day, do not arrive at a reasonable solution. But very often, you know, with, with goodwill on both sides, um, thing, situations that seemed, you know, impossible to resolve turned out to be perfectly possible. You know, I don't know what more to say about that. Yeah, and the next question is similar about a client with fire, who had yeah. uh, fires in two different apartments. Um, so, any resources that we have, I think, you know, those questions would be better, better post the network, right? Like these factual questions about what resources are available for clients who have different types of difficulties. Um, and then, you know, in terms of yeah. is, you know, doing two relocations that satisfy the provider's requirements basically to reasonable, reasonably accommodate someone. That's not a question that we can answer again, right? It's, it's always a very fact specific question. Yeah, Evan, I think, uh, thank you. And to Sandra and, and to Ed too, I'm not stopping you. I'm just acknowledging that um, we'll be compiling some of these and um, we'll be doing some follow up with folks afterwards. So thank you. Right, and you know, I think there, there are two questions here, right? That a lot of the these questions have kind of raised the surface. Number one, you know, what is your obligation under the law? In a lot of ways, that's a very broad and theoretical answer. And that's the answer that we're trying to give you is like the frameworks that we believe and the law says that you need to operate within. But all of those sub questions are very fact dependent and it's you yourselves who are often gonna have the best answers for those, right? About how to go about actually implementing these frameworks that we provided in this presentation. And then the final question, I'm not sure exactly what this question- Evan, before you get to that, I just wanted to yeah. just piggyback on what you just said that, you know, what's apparent from the questions, you know, that are coming up here is that, you know, you are all, and, you know, it's no surprise, you know, currently um, making efforts to accommodate your residents, you know, and I, I, I as, as one would, would think you would. And, and so in that sense, you are, you know, complying with the law and you know, the hard issue is just sort of where, you know, where the the edges of that duty uh, come and those and that that's the hard thing to um, to determine, you know, especially in the abstract, you know, on a, on a webinar. Um, but but the the thing that that is the takeaway is that there is a duty to do the kinds of things that you were doing now and um, and and not at the outset, shut the door and say, wait, this is impossible. There can't possibly be an accommodation here. And then how far down the road you go, that's when it becomes difficult. But by that point, you know, you already have gone, you know, a fair way towards complying with uh, your requirements under the law. And that's, you know, and that's what's, what's important. Okay. Um, so 
Thanks, Ed. Yeah, so a few final questions. Will we get a copy of this presentation? The answer to that is yes. Um, and the network will be in touch with you all about that. Can you talk more about the meaning of reasonable and the phrase reasonable accommodation? So that's something that we've kind of touched on throughout this past hour and a half that there is no hard and fast answer there, right? And it depends on the facts, you know, what the tenant is requesting and what the characteristics of the provider are. Um, but, you know, the definition is essentially one that would pose an undue financial or administrative burden. So basically it would require you to go too far. And what too far is, is a fact dependent answer. And so we can't, you know, give a, you know, a clear answer to that for anybody without application to specific facts. Um, the final question is, I'm inquiring how to learn to be a housing specialist and what are the requirements? I'm not sure what that question is asking. So if the person who asked it, you could either raise your hand and say it out loud or put more information in the chat. Um, with respect to, you know, how to work, if it means like how to work for or with MFJ or legal aid, you can check our websites and there are positions available um, pretty frequently for both attorneys and non-attorneys. And so you could take a look at that. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure what housing specialist means. Yeah, I think that's more of a question for Shinny or yeah. CUCS um, resources that are available to folks working in the supportive housing landscape. Indeed, indeed. Um, yes, you can follow up with me. I put my email in the chat. And actually, we do have job postings on our website. So let me find that and put that link in the chat as well. Great, and I think that about takes us to time. Um, we might have time for one more question if someone wants to put it in the Q&A. Um, but otherwise, we thank you so much for your time. It's really heartening from our perspective that so many people, I think it got up to 154 people, yeah. were on this presentation at some point. Um, the fact that you all are obviously grappling with these issues day to day is very apparent, as Ed said. And, we really appreciate you taking the time to hear from us um, early in the morning. And, you know, we hope that that will resolve in, you know, the we have the same goal, right? That the people uh, living in your buildings stay housed and have experiences that allow them to, you know, live, live with dignity, right? Um, and live um, essentially like being able to carry out their day-to-day -day activities the best way possible. So. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us today. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Evan, Sandra, Edward. My email is in the chat. This webinar will be, it's being recorded, so we'll post it. We'll share the slide.